behind most of the products we buy are people. Sure, we have machines making lots of things today, but the best products almost always have a human touch. The garment workers who make the majority of the clothes we buy are paid some of the world's lowest industrial wages. This leaves them with few options and makes it difficult for them to get ahead. Maybe you've seen this label on the chocolate you eat or the coffee you buy. Fair trade uses a market-based approach to move workers towards receiving fair compensation for their labor and safe working conditions. It improves livelihoods through trade, not aid, and is one of several initiatives we're taking at Patagonia to help the people who make our gear earn closer to a living wage. The decisions we make with the products we buy have real impacts that reach around the world. This season, we're offering 33 fair trade certified styles. Next season, 173. We're proud to be one of more than 800 brands that have returned over $150 million to workers through fair trade. We've got a long way to go, but we're making progress. Playing fair since 2014. If you really want to have an adventure that's not going to be sexy, it's going to be dirty, and it's going to be rowdy, there's a place out here for you. My passion for climbing really is what helps me drive protecting this place. I thought, you know what, this is my opportunity to make a difference where I have heart in what I want to do. This place has needed to be protected for a hundred years. Just loving a place isn't enough. You gotta have a willingness to protect it. Human history is full of misconceptions and facts that were simply misunderstood. Until the sixth century, we thought the world was flat. Some of us still think climate change isn't caused by human activity. But hemp, this low impact fiber is still one of the most misunderstood on the planet. For the last time, hemp is not pot. You can't really get high smoking it, yet it's still illegal to grow it in most parts of the country and much of the world. Which is a bummer, because hemp is an amazing thing. It's naturally pest resistant. It requires no synthetic fertilizer and half the amount of water that cotton does. It's strong, reliable, and grows extremely fast. It actually improves the soil by replenishing vital nutrients and preventing topsoil erosion. Back in the 40s, the US government thought hemp was great. Hemp for victory. Let's make it that way again. Until then, we can be your dealer. Patagonia Hemp for recreational use since 1997. Damnation took us three years, and I think for us, initially, we were concerned because who gives a shit about dam removal? It's a little weird. I mean, I'm not real comfortable in getting in a dress suit. I'd rather be in a wetsuit swimming around in a river, but it's about making change and getting behind difficult but really important issues. I don't think anything changes without people forcing it to change. And to see 70,000 people sign a petition asking the Obama administration to take out the four Lower Snake River dams is a powerful thing. The goal of, of this project is to bring that momentum from the petition to decision makers. And it's, it's a privilege to get to come here and deliver that message. Every edifice that man builds, every dam that we put up, every pipeline that we put in, every open pit coal mine, it all has to be restored someday. So, you know, there's 40,000 obsolete dams left in America still, and they have to come down. For a long time, I think we'd both been kind of frustrated with how best to let people know about the damage the dams are causing. We were at the Wild Scenic Film Festival in Nevada City. Travis actually was at that film festival and we pitched him on the idea of, of making a film about dam removals and he, he just kind of stared at us blankly like, that sounds like an awful idea. <laughs> 
we premiered at South by Southwest and I think we left there not really sure what the response was. And then we got the Audience Choice Award, which surprised us a lot. I think for me, that's when I realized that people were really responding to it. We've just had an incredible response, both domestically and internationally, to the film and to the idea of dam removal. There's dams coming out in almost all 50 states. They're removing their first big dam in Japan right now. We screened it in Finland. I actually talked to the parliament there, and two days later they voted to remove this dam in Helsinki. It's pretty good to have a few little victories like this. It's a reminder that activism works. So this DC trip represents a really important milestone and benchmark with Damnation, both the film and the campaign. We're back here for the third time talking to folks from the Obama administration. We met with folks from the Center for Environmental Quality. The Chairman Mike Boots received our petition this afternoon. We also just met with the Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell, who sat down with us for a number of minutes to talk about the importance of dam removal and river restoration and, and the work that her department can get involved in. This time going out there, it was clear that the message was getting across and there's a lot of support. We're here delivering the petition, but the petition's going to stay open, and I think it rests on, on everyone's plate that cares about this issue to make it known to their elected officials. There's a lot of work to do, and it, it really just starts with one person having an imagination and, and seeing the possibilities of, of restoring a watershed. What do you think this shirt, right off the rack at the big box store, what do you think it costs? 10, 15 bucks? Wrong. Well, technically you're right, but you're wrong when you consider this. Seeing a conventional cotton shirt only costs 15 bucks is like saying all a dam does is form a reservoir. Two words, collateral damage. It all starts here with fluffy white cotton. Consider this. The year we rejected it, 6.9 million pounds of synthetic pesticides were applied to conventional cotton in California alone. That's a lot of chemicals. But who cares, right? We don't eat cotton. Synthetic pesticides are sprayed directly onto the cotton crop. 60% of the cotton's weight is in the seed. The cotton seed is fed to dairy cows. Thirsty? This cotton is then processed and turned into the majority of the clothes that we buy. But there's an alternative, organically grown cotton. It doesn't use synthetic pesticides, insecticides, or herbicides. In 1996, Patagonia began the exclusive use of organically grown cotton in all of our cotton products. The decision was not without considerable risks, but we never looked back. For now, growing organically costs more, but it's worth it. It's friendlier on our environment and ultimately on us. Patagonia has been all organic cotton since 1996.
Come on, Tommy. Come on. Boom! Yeah! Psych, dude! Well done, Tommy! silly that everyone wants to buy new all the time and throw away everything that they have. My mom used to sew everything. She made my clothes, she made curtains, blankets for us, and it was just a normal part of our household. Sometimes the repair techs will spend hours and hours on our garment. You know, it's the customer's favorite jacket. They've taken around the world with them. I didn't want just a job to have a job. I wanted to do something to make a difference and I think everyone that works here feels that way. We love getting letters. It's a nice connection with the people that are sending in their repairs. It makes us really feel good about what we're doing. Dear Dahlia, I'm sending this card to thank you so very much for the incredible repair you did for my vest. I use it every day and it has been with me through thick and thin. My mom raised my brother and I to explore the world with unwavering curiosity. The Deep South, the Ozark Mountains, the Great Route, Plains. Paris to Pretoria and used the same gear in the Caracorum in 1992. It's seen many days of work in the clinic delivering babies and it's always with me, whether it's hunting season or skiing eastern ice. The mud and blood stains grew, but the shirt never withered. It has done just about everything I have in the last three decades. I was heartbroken when I realized that I'd inadvertently set fire to it with a grinder. Yesterday, I found my jacket in the mail, perfectly rebuilt. Thanks for bringing it back to life. I can't tell you how much the quality of your work means to me, especially in this throwaway culture of ours. Thanks, John. September 10th, 2013, Santa Fe, New Mexico. board shorts for six or seven years. My brother got them for me as a gift. Goodwill in Nantucket or something like that back on the East Coast. I mean, they were go-to for everything, surfing, just going to the beach, kayaking. A lot of memories associated with them. I had to hold on to them. This 
lived with me when I guided the John Muir Trail. I always had this. And it has been a bell cap, triple direct. It was an all girls team, it was my best friend and myself. And we spent five days on it and it never came off of me. About four years ago, I gave up being a guide and I became a farmer. And so this is the last relic piece of my guiding days. And it's my favorite. Traceable down. The birds that provide us with down are raised and slaughtered for their meat. Down is just a byproduct. That's the harsh reality. Some of these birds endure some pretty inhumane stuff in the process. When meat is the priority, force feeding tubes can be stuck down their throats to fatten their livers. Foie gras, anyone? And when down is the priority, birds can be live plucked. It's brutal. We learned about these practices in 2007, then we did a supply chain assessment of the materials we use. We asked a lot of questions of our down supplier, who assured us that our down was just fine. Turns out, it wasn't. Tracing down from bird farm to parka is a complicated, time-consuming, and expensive thing to do. Fall 2014 marked an important milestone for us, one we're extremely proud of. From that season on, all Patagonia down products contain only 100% traceable down. This is down that can be traced back to birds that were never force fed and never live plucked. It provides the highest assurance of animal welfare in the apparel industry, so you can stay warm with good conscience for the birds since 2014. I don't think you'll find another place like this anywhere in the world. These towers that shoot into the sky. In Patagonia, you have 5,000 foot faces rising straight out of the glacier, like rows of sharpened teeth. The climbing here is very technically challenging. No, I mean, you're talking about always climbing vertical granite. There's a lot of ice and mixed climbing, what we like to call alpine trickery. You get terrible weather there. You're so close to the Pacific. The storms come in off the ocean, they just slam into the mountains. It's so sudden and so ferocious. If you get caught in one of those storms, you're in big trouble. These crazy rime ice mushrooms form that can become like a bombing range. That's right where we were, right where that came down. It's a very, very serious place that should not be taken lightly. The first thing you see, even from hundreds of miles away as you're driving into town, is the Fitzroy skyline. How would you not want to try a skyline like that? I mean, you see it, and it's just it's the obvious thing. Oh, yeah, I want to go up and down all that thing. The full Fitz Traverse is the biggest project waiting to get done. Seven beautiful summits all lined up in one straight ridge. We climb all of those peaks in one go. It's an objective that has been talked about for a long time. You know, who's going to do it? Someone could think that the people who are going to do that have got to be some grizzled alpinist. Wait, Tommy? You mean the rock climber? Oh, oh no, Tommy's a lot more than a rock climber. I've been climbing my whole life, but I was kind of a fair weather rock climber. When I thought of Patagonia, I thought of burly dudes with big beards suffering in the mountains. But then I came down with my friend Topher and had just a mind-blowing trip. I knew that if he could handle the ice and the snow and the wind, that then if we could get him to the rock, that he would totally crush it. Once you get to the rock climbing, it's incredible. I mean, it was like nothing else I've experienced. 
ever since then I've just craved these big objectives. It was very clear that he could change the game in Patagonia. I came back a couple more times and I'd always see that iconic Fitzroy Massif ridgeline. The idea to traverse the entire thing seemed like one of the most obvious, awesome objectives I had ever seen. Starts here, go. The traverse is four miles long. It involves a 12,000 feet of vertical gain. You need to keep going many, many days. You'd have to be able to move really fast over thousands of feet of vertical rock. So that's why I asked Alex if he wanted to go down to Patagonia and try and climb this thing with me. You know, the ability to be bold, which we all know Alex was super bold, is kind of the key to going fast down there. I'm off, Tommy! Yay! You know, I mean, Tommy's the man. I've looked up to him since I was 12. I've never had much interest in alpine climbing. I don't know how to use ice tools. I don't like being cold, but if Tommy says that we can do it, I'm willing to go with him. Because anytime Tommy wants to climb, like, you're going to do something cool. So what do you guys think you're going to climb? It's a yeah. little wintry in the mountains. Something snowy, probably. We're going to turn into alpine climbers, see how that goes. I don't know how it's going to go for me. <laughs> Not that well. This year, I decided to bring my whole family. <laughs> so what do you think of this, Alex? <laughs> I named my son Fitz after the mountain because this place has been so special to me. Gonna go climb your mountain. Hopefully. When this weather window showed up on the forecast, I learned that Rolando Garibaldi and Colin Haley were gonna try the Fitz Traverse as well. Rolo and Colin are like the gurus. They're the Patagonia experts. Rolo wrote the guidebook. I figured they had a way better chance than we had. Rollo and I tried the Fitz Traverse twice together. Uh, both times we didn't get very far. I thought that Tommy and Alex had a good chance of pulling it off. This mountain's like kind of intense. And I definitely thought that Rollo and I had a good chance of pulling it off also. Obviously all of us would have liked to pull it off first. I'm pretty stoked to uh, race for the Fitzroy range. <laughs> yeah, this is actually going to be <laughs> kind of classic. We felt like such gumbies compared to Rollo and Colin. Got some good snow conditions going on. Yeah, it was just a nightmare. We show up at the base. Well, Alex had brought the wrong kind of crampon. Got some crampons. And his crampon was made to clip onto a mountain boot, and all we had were Gore-Tex tennis shoes. I wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> it was going to be really difficult, potentially a little dangerous, because there was a good chance those crampons were just going to fall right off. We ran into Tommy and Alex at the start of the Fitz Traverse. We chatted with them for a few minutes and then started up. They started up a big snow goalie. Being rock climbers, we did the steep technical rock climb, but we quickly realized that there was a lot of ice in the cracks. Alex is climbing with an ice tool clip to his harness. We were just chopping ice out of all the cracks as we tried to climb them. Putting cams in, being like, I don't know, if, if one lobe is on ice, is that okay? <laughs> Oh yeah, Tommy. Oh yeah. How was that pitch? My hand's bleeding, my jacket's full of holes. We got up to this point about two thirds of the way up Gijeme and Rolo and Colin were sitting on a ledge waiting for us. Rolo was feeling super sick and that was it for us. We had to go down. And we knew that Alex had these crampons that really weren't gonna work and they were just gonna try anyways. Before they went down, Rolo actually took off his own crampons and gave them to Alex, which was a giant gesture. For Rolo to just basically give up his dream of doing the Fitz Traverse and then give me the tools that I need to finish the Traverse, you're like, oh, that's, you know, I mean, that's very big of him. I mean, we offered them a bunch of water and basically give them a hand on whatever we could. Our small participation in, in, in their Traverse, so our small contribution is a pair of crampons. For the next four days, we climbed up and down thousands of feet. We destroyed ourselves and our equipment. And there was a lot of times when I thought we were in way over our heads, but that's what makes for really rich experiences. There's Tommy sending the gnar. This is gonna be so rad, dude. This is the kind of thing I see in Alpinist Magazine, <laughs> except we're actually doing it. Pretty epic camp setup. Oh wow, dude, check out the shadow. We're about to climb to the actual summit. Tommy's about to aid it through the night. I feel a little intimidated at the moment. Yeah, don't worry about it though. You're a total boss. Woo, on the summit! Ah!
we are in a unique circumstance to be at Conservation Patagonica now. I wanted to come see the work that's being done to help this land return to its natural state. I think it's important to bring attention to what they're trying to do here. Well, national parks are the gold standard of conservation. They represent a good form of social equity. They belong to everyone. When somebody asks me why here instead of someplace else, I say, first of all, just look around you. That's a hint. The idea would be to come down and use running to tell a story about Conservation Patagonica. To run 100 miles through through the future Patagonia National Park. My name is Luke Nelson. My name is Chrissy Mayo. My name is Jeff Browning. And I guess I'm a runner. I'm a trail runner. I'm an ultra runner. Epic. So many times in environmental activism, we don't win the fight. And here they are. Recycled polyester. At Patagonia, we started using recycled polyester in 93. Do you remember 1993? This was a computer, a cell phone, a car. This was rock climbing and a snap tee. This is how polyester garments were being made by most clothing companies. Pump, refine, transport, manufacture, buy, discard, repeat. Pump, refine, transport, manufacture, buy, discard, repeat. It's a happy-go-spending world. But starting in 1993, this is how we made ours. We begin with recycled plastic bottles, which are melted down into pellets, then spun into yarn. The yarn turns into garments. It's 2015. Welcome to the future. This is a computer, a phone, a car. This is rock climbing. This is still a snap tee. It's 22 years later, and most polyester garments are still being made the same old way. We've expanded our use of recycled polyester, and the number of garments using it is increasing all the time. It's 2015. We've been talking trash since 1993. The most important thing is your job suits your lifestyle. Living on a boat really brings things back to the basics. The essential things become so much more highlighted. My dad was a really avid fisherman. His way of putting food on the table was just to always go out and get us dinner. The more you allow yourself to be open-minded, the more you'll see that a lot of us are doing it all backwards. When I get to meet other girls like Liz and Leia, they're passionate about similar things. It blows my mind. Like, I didn't even realize I was missing that. Everything is possible. It's just that we need to trust ourselves. It's all about challenging yourself to the point that you feel you pushed yourself to your max. Because if you don't, you'll always wonder where that is. You know, finding that balance of where you feel comfortable and where you're not pushing yourself hard enough. And Liz, like doing their own thing, gives me a lot of confidence and it pushes me towards my best. That's what I feel inside. I'm just so thankful. This is what I want to be associated with. It doesn't have to be about the money, it doesn't have to be about publicity. It's about holding myself to be a more accountable person. The more that I go in that direction, I feel like I'm part of something bigger. And this whole bigger picture, it keeps me in check tap into your inner voice, your inner instincts, and 
Be your authentic self and nothing else. Let's talk about chemistry. All right, why not? Not that kind of chemistry, this kind. Chemistry can be both good and bad. It can be used for so many things. The fact is, without chemistry, we wouldn't have most of the products around today. Enter textile factories. The textile and apparel industry can be dirty, like medieval times dirty. We could use a little more than a dusting off. Some factories are like bad science experiments, mixing concoctions of toxic chemicals without regard for where they'll end up. They take clean water, mix in dyes and chemicals to apply them to the fabrics, and then dump the polluted water. The fishings have to be pretty good in the very shadow of the mill. So how do we change this? Maybe those chemists have an idea. That's what BlueSign is. BlueSign is based on input stream management. That's a fancy way of saying that they examine and screen each chemical concoction before it comes into a textile mill to ensure that no toxic chemicals are coming out. Blue Sign approved materials are safer for the environment, safer for workers, and safer for the end customers. In 2007, Patagonia became the first brand to officially join the Blue Sign network. There are now over 300 brands, manufacturers, and chemical suppliers who are Blue Sign system partners. That's the good kind of chemistry. Patagonia. First designed since 2007. El CERT me está dando una oportunidad de, de poder hablar y expresar la realidad de mi país. Y esa voz yo creo que tengo que aprovecharla. It's incredible to think from where he comes. They don't have almost nothing, you know? The Cinderella story of all Cinderella stories. It's probably the most far-fetched, outlandish thing you know, I could have ever dreamed. Conviction, that's, that's the word. The conviction he has, you know? Blocking the sewage pipeline really did galvanize Ramon's position as an environmentalist. He's the unifier, and he, you know, he's the guy that's gonna make it happen. In those early days, I brought him out for his first time to Waimea. I think 10 years later, we were surfing in the Eddie Aikau together. I got goosebumps all up my back right now. It was, it was crazy to watch that in person. Hay una revolución, puede ser escuchada. It only takes one wave to change your life.